need Sophie's earrings to go with my dress. <laughs> I was just saying, I need your earrings to go with my dress. <laughs> Okay, we're going to make a start. Good to go. Good to go. Kia ora koutou and welcome to this uh, council meeting of the 23rd of February. Um, I'll ask Andre Baker to start with the karakia. Thank you. A tēnā koutou, kei te hunga e taitinana mai ki tēnei tō tātou nei huhuinga mō te wā nei. Mei tuku ngā whakamoimiti kei te hunga ki Tamaki Makaurau, lere atu ki Tai Rāwhiti, ki te Matawā Māui, rotu i te Takiwā o Ngāti Porau, o Ngāti Kahungunu, Ngāi Tāmanuhiri o te rā ngā koutou, ngā toiora o te huripari. Nei rā atu mihi ki a koutou. E whātoro ana te ngā kau ki a rātou o te wahi ngaro, e tau mai te manāki tanga ki runga ki tēnei huhuinga Tā wharautia mātou te kākuhu take o te mana atua o te mana āriki. Tūturu kia rongo whakamaua kia tēnā. Tēnā. Huie. Kai ki. Just respectfully acknowledging survivors of the cyclone up north, down coast, into the Hawke's Bay and across to the Wairarapa, and just extending our blessings and our best wishes to all of those people at the moment who are affected and respectful of the... Relief that has been provided to them at this time from all around Aotearoa, New Zealand. Kia ora, kia ora kato. Kia ora. Certainly our thoughts are with those many, many people who are affected and particularly the families of those who are still missing at present. Um, our council has um, joined up with a programme with LGNZ and we'll be providing particular support to Whangarei, each council who who wants to participate and is an affected has been teamed up, so to speak, with a with another council. So we look forward to speeding, supporting in particular the people of Whangare. Um, so we'll move now to the agenda. Um, welcome, everybody. Welcome to elected members, councillors, and also um, a good complement of community board members present at the table today. Welcome. Um, and to council staff, those in the public gallery, and to our public speakers today. And we'll now have the Council Blessing, which Liz Coe has agreed to share with us. As we, on the issues, <laughs> as we deliberate on the issues before us, we trust that we will reflect positively on the communities we serve. Let us all seek to be effective and just, so that with courage, vision and energy, we provide positive leadership in a spirit of harmony and compassion. Thank you, Liz. Uh, we now move to apologies. I have an apology from Deputy Mayor Lawrence Kirby, who's unwell. Any other apologies? I'll look for a mover for that apology. Moved by Councillor Sophie Hanford, seconded by Councillor Bravanov. All in favour? Aye. That's carried. Do I have any declarations of interest relating to items on the agenda? Can't see any. We don't have anything under item five or six. So we move to public speaking time for items relating to the agenda. And I have first on my list Martin Freinstein. Please come to the table and please feel free to sit um, as you give your presentation. Kia ora, welcome. Thank you. Madam Chair, <coughs> I, <coughs> I've been told I only have three minutes, so I only, managed, <laughs> I only managed to get through the first page of something, and I think that that's going to take more than three minutes. So 
This is to do with the response to the local government and the, uh, <clears throat> the response that effectively Kapiti is giving to central government around these proposed changes. And in those proposed changes, there's an idea that there's a lack of trust from the community in local government. And um, there's also an idea that the, it's rather difficult for people in, in the community to actually understand where their money is going and what the, what's actually happening with it. Now, I get to attachment number two in the uh, submission, which says that there's, um, there's some panel recommendations. And then there's next to it, and this is item 10.1 on appendix one, that the Capital Coast District Council submissions is basically a response to what is being said by the panel. And I read with um, a little bit of, hmm, I'm not sure what it is. I'm a little bit nervous that statements can be made that 50% of the people feel they are involved in decision making. Um, if it was 50% and they're involved in decision making, then surely the, the turnout at the local government elections would have been more than 50% or in the vicinity of 50%. So I'm just not sure where that's actually based on. That's the first point. The other point is around the idea of having um, appointed people and um, people that are voted on by the by the voters in, in this area. And my question is, I don't understand in this whole process how those people that are appointed are in actual fact responsible to whom? Who are the appointed people, on, be it on this council, be it on any particular committee, who are they responsible to? My understanding would be to the people that appointed them. And if the people that appointed them are not the local community, then who are they actually responsible for and why are they actually there? If the committee or the body is an actual fact for the local people. So that's just a question that I haven't found an answer to. So maybe it will it'll come out somewhere along the line. The other part is that there's a recommendation here that uh, the Electoral Commission would administer local elections and the use of the STV. And then there's a comment which I didn't quite understand at all. And that is the recommendation that 16-year-olds um, should be able to vote. A 16-year-old cannot even buy liquor. And it's taken, and a 16-year-old doesn't even have the authority to drive on the roads. But they are going to be allowed to vote. I somehow other don't, something doesn't quite gel. And were the people of Kapiti actually asked if that's what they want? And I know I haven't been asked, I, but it seems from this, and this is just on the first page, so I'm scared to actually read the rest of it because um, I might need a few hours. So I take it that my three minutes is up already. Uh, well, fortunately, not everybody is actually flying in the sky. But we are all on the ground. remind councillors not, not to debate with the public speaker, but I will now welcome any questions. <laughs> <laughs> So I, we don't appear to have any questions. No. Thank you for, for sharing your thoughts with us today. It's certainly a really important issue, issue this uh, future for local government review and those democratic issues that you share. Uh, they're, they're, they're certainly of concern in our community, so thanks for coming along today. Much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, do we have Keith Jeffries? No? Um, David Ogden. Welcome, David. My, my fellow candidates, we got to know a few people during the 
the uh, election. Um, Co David Ogden, uh, Rauri Okutani, as my tohanga gave me when I was uh, in another position. Thank you for the, this opportunity. As I said to Her Worship, I will only speak at meetings when I think of something I want to say anyway. Um, and I want to touch briefly on climate change and also the headings that are in uh, non-public um, about uh, this appointment and also, uh, what, what's the heading for it? Um, I'll get back to that anyway. My three minutes may be up if and you start, start throwing <laughs> shall, apples. Shall we and, start uh, the clock again, please? <laughs> flying instructions about planes at me, you know. Why you'd want to fly a plane with only one engine, I don't know. I mean, I see you on Facebook and you're everywhere, but... <laughs> Never mind. So I just want to turn... There's something that's really disturbed me, Madam, that on the Stuff website about um, uh, the Esk Valley. And it appears that the regional council and the local council were derelict in their duties for the measurement of water flowing down the rivers and the... Um, also the, um, the substation for the electricity failed. The, they were, did have it on their work schedule. But I, could I point out to people here, in my view, that three years will go like that. And you have three years to effect change. Talking to one of the councillors here, Councillor Holiday, yesterday, uh, after our old person's, older person's council meeting, thank you for coming to that, Councillor, we could have a, 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 a rain ban sitting over this district for two or three days, as has been my experience, Wainu Mata in South Wairapa. We had 443 millilitres of rain and just trees sliding off the hills. Now, I think, and we accept, I think there are a few more believers after the last few weeks about the amount of rain that we're going to have. And it's now your responsibility. You do not have any um, outage out, out of this responsibility that you have. You have to come up with plans that are best thought of and are, are effective for this particular district and our brothers in arms, Horofanua. So um, I just put that challenge out there. It's a very serious matter, and um, no doubt, no, it's good that you're discussing it, I see it's in the agenda. And I won't stay around and just say a few words which you will accept or just ignore, as is the case. Um, now, just find the agenda. Um, I've been interested in the yes, re resolution exclude the public, it's on, the, on here, but whether I'm inferring that it's been just not advertised very well, or whether you're, impli you're implying that it's you know, not important for the public to know. I just haven't seen the advertisements for that. I've, I've got a, quite a good idea of the web your website, which is very good, really. I haven't seen any about it, although the Horofanua one had similar um, uh, notices in their website. So um, that's what it is. I hope you get some very good people. I understand you're going to appoint them tomorrow, today. Um, the other thing too, Madam Chair, is property update. Now, I think this should be in the public arena. Uh, and something, somewhere else that I've been, that's the bell to come out fighting. Uh, one minute, thank you. Um, I think you should, if you have not already got one, you should have a list of all your properties. I think you should go through them. You should make, have a review involving all the officers or the officers that are relevant and decide which properties you need and then decide how you'll use the resulting cash. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. Do we have any questions? Yeah, thanks for your time coming along today <laughs> and, and thanks for your ongoing time that you put into our business of council. Yes. Oh, Martin. Sorry, Thank I you. Slow, Mark. Madam Chair. 
Um, thank you for coming in, David. I've one got two questions. One's a clarification. Just the last part of what you were talking about, that was in relation to the um, advertised positions for audit and risk. Is that right? That is correct, yes. Yeah. Uh, so maybe there's some answers there with regards to how that was publicly notified. I think that's what you're asking. Yeah, right? I, I, oh. it's just, I, I rang an officer here, and the officer doesn't know, you know, the officers don't know everything, and the reply I got was that it hadn't been advertised. So... Um, I'll but ask, it, but I'll it, must ask it must have been. It must have been. So, so I, I think we'll respond to that in public speaking time responses. Cool. Thank you, um, Councillor um, Halliday. Sec second question. Um, obviously, David, you've got um, a substantial background in local government with regards to your merity positions down in the hut. Um, About the what? Your, your, so you've got a big background in, in local government with regards to your background. Oh. I'm, I'm nothing, but I've just <laughs> been, I'm, I've been through life and seen a few things. Yeah. But. Um, You lost your button there. I tell you what, the regional council, we all had um, things that we worked on all the time. These are a pile of nuisances, these things, these these microphones. Yeah, I'll turn that off. No, I can't turn it off. I think. Okay, okay, there we go. Um, thank you, Dean Services. Um, and, and just after my conversation with you, it's just a brief answer required, but in light of what's happened up north, um, would it be a fair comment to say, that business as usual, if you like, has, has definitely changed and we should be considering how we do business in regards to the resilience of our community is a heck of a lot of a higher priority based on those events. That's a good point. And, uh, so Could you turn your microphone back so, on, please? Uh, it's on. Yeah. I'll, I'll get closer, you wish it. Um, it. It's so obvious. And there are, there are houses built in this wonderful place and I walked over the whole of the ward just about in the election, popping pamphlets. But some of them should not have been built. They're low lying. Great work is being done on um, uh, stormwater drains. I came across people working on it and they're doing work just out here. Fantastic. And that's that's three waters at work. So and but we need to be forward thinking. That the next event might be here next week. Mm. And it might be double what they're having up there. I don't know what we're doing. <laughs> and what about the tsunami that could have come with the, 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 the earthquake, the other plague that we had? That was such a worry the other day. I don't know what you do about a tsunami okay. here. But any, any further questions, Councillor Halliday? Right, that's great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Councillor Wilson. Yep. Had, to put up oh, some, had to put up some <laughs> locust nets. <laughs> That's right. um, thanks, David. I just um, just wondering about like with the property update, um, and I kind of I get the point about the you know if there's negotiations going on some of that commercial stuff, but the I just want to tease out a little bit more about um, why you think that that should be not public excluded. I'm just ringing a bell, that's all. Yep. And that's all I'm doing. Okay. Too much is talked about in the committees. The public should know about it. But you get more public interest. It's good to have people coming here with troubles and getting, giving you feedback. And it's good if you can solve the problems. Yeah, thank you for that. Cool. Um, before we move on, I'm just going to invite a response to the question around the advertising of the... Um, it was about the risk and assurance independent members. Oh, thank you. Darren, would you like to respond to that? Thank you. Thanks for your worship. As I understand, the uh, public excluded is advertised as part of the agenda which is published in advance of today. Yes. Um, and clearly sets out the reasons why that topic is being discussed and public excluded. Well, it's, hello, it's nice to meet you anyway, <laughs> and good luck. And Well, the, the reasons are, um, they may well be in the body of the paper. I've just looked at the agenda, sir. So. Adam, a point of clarity? Madam Chair? Um, David, if I just clarify, um, is that okay? I think just wait until the next answer and then see if you still need to do that. My answer. Mm -hmm. my, my, my another answer. <laughs> was that your question or, or was your question in relation to the advertising of the roles? Um, well, bearing my soul, I was interested in the positions. 
and I wanted to apply. But I hadn't seen the ads. Gotcha. We don't always get the papers. You know, it was a surprise to know that you're going to decide. There was no no um, indiscretion given uh, when I got, gained that at all. Quite happy about the integrity of my comments. But good luck, you know. I mean, it doesn't matter. Life goes on. So, yeah. Yep. So, thank you. So, so, so it was advertised widely and openly. Oh, okay. And we did receive a number of quality Yes, uh, that's good. I'm pleased to hear that. Uh, I'm sorry that I missed them. Thank you. That clarifies that. Councillor Halliday, thank you so much for coming. No, it's, and, I enjoy and for it. all the work you do. Oh, it's so good. I can come to the meetings and talk about things. I don't have to be here for five hours, you know. <laughs> <laughs> or six. Yeah. How do you write? Qu quality time spent, that's for sure. OK, so I think unless Kevin Jeffries has arrived, that brings us to the end of public speaking. Uh, members' business. Any leaves of absence? Anybody want to apply for a leave of absence through this forum? No? Uh, I have had no notification of matters of an urgent nature. Nothing under item 9 today. Um, so we move on to reports. Item 10. First we have the review into the future for local government submission. And I welcome Joe Bryan to the table to present this report. Through you, Madam Chair. Kia ora and tēnā koutou katoa. Our submission on the review into future for local government provides comment on the independent panel's draft report. It is not proposed reform, and we would expect recommendations to change based on feedback from this stage in the process. The submission is due Tuesday next week, so there's a relatively tight timeline for um, accommodating final changes. Um, there is a recommendation in the report in the report that the mayor, deputy mayor, and deputy and, and CE sorry, consider any final amendments to the submission before it's provided on the 28th of February. We take the submission as read and welcome any comment, but before we do so, I'll just provide a quick recap of some of the key points in the submission. Firstly, we largely agreed with the panel's suggestions for change. Our submission suggested we need a local government that is agile to prepare for and respond to challenges in its, in its operating environment. Um, looking recently at Cyclone Gabriel, for example, takes the lead on civic education, obviously with the Ministry of Education, and considers a broader range of democratic processes to put increase participation and trust in the community. That it's protected by constitution, that we have more sustainable funding with more support from central government, particularly around climate change fund. Our submission suggests some system level changes, including pursuing a closer, more direct working relationship with central government to work in partnership on joint outcomes with joint investment and co-design. No more unfunded mandates from central government and use of regulatory impact statements. Central government paying rates on its properties and local government keeping GST on rates to reinvest back in the community. The role of the local government commission um, also came into play and we think that perhaps more guidance on representation reviews might be useful and it could um, take up a new role around investigation of complaints. An enhanced role for the electoral, electoral commission in, in local elections, lowering the voting age and making it easier for local candidates to stand for election, also that they be supported with professional development and adequate remuneration. More work needs to be done in a few areas with central government and Māori to enable Te Tiriti o Waitangi to be more effectively embedded within the whole of government system and how it can be supported by increased capability and capacity. Um, also more work, more work on the roles, specific roles of local government going forward relative to the roles of central and regional government and the needs, sorry, and this needs to be done before moving to structural solutions. Some of the issues that we had were around the sequencing of this ref potential reform relative to the other reforms that have been coming through, ideally 
future for local government review would have happened first um, to inform the other reforms. Um, that function should be followed by form and then by funding. That's the structural issue. Then there is no one size fits all when it comes to local government. Um, balancing the tension between localism and centralism. Transparency and value for money in a joined up system. Particularly if we're going to have uh, a mixture of rates and taxes. Um, people need to see the total cost of what's, um, what's involved and how it's spent and obviously preserving the local voice. Um, and at this point, the panel's report didn't include any costs around the changes. That's understood given they're not final recommendations. They're still draft and likely to change. However, obviously, we'd expect the next stage in the process to provide that type of information for us. So would you like to add anything to that, Chris? OK, so I'll just open it up for questions. Yeah, thank you for the work that's gone into this report and to, and to the uh, submission. It's certainly um, certainly a, a, a great start. So uh, I'll go for questions. Um, Councillor Coe. Um, yes, I'm just... Um, oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, very thorough report. I'm just wondering um, if you've given consideration to the different skill sets that might be required in terms of the workforce, you know, doing workforce planning for council staff and for elected members because it seems to me yeah that transition will you know there'll be a whole you know different range of skill sets required and you know how we've covered um, that off is do you feel you've sufficiently covered that in your response thank you um, we haven't got to that point in the process yet it's a very good point and I think it will definitely need to be addressed going forward but I think it's probably just a little too early, particularly given the actual roles of local government going forward haven't been firmed up. Yep. Rather than councillors having to frame their comments as a question at this point, because, because we're kind of discussing the submission, I'll just open this up for a kind of general discussion around the submission. I'll also suggest that if there are any major changes we want to make, if we can flag those today, and then um, we can have some suggestions in writing to be approved by... The, um, the approval group, whoever that ends up being, I have a suggested change to that. Um, Councillor Spire. Thank you. Um, I've got lots of notes written all over my agenda, but I won't read them all out because I will embarrass myself. But <laughs> just wondering, um, with more, if we get funding from central government, because this is just looking like a takeover, some of it to me, Will that result in more, just to your, you don't have to answer, around more dictatorship and will local governments start losing, will we start losing our autonomy? Uh, I think um, that would all need to be worked through council affairs. Um, ultimately, any central government funding comes with accountability um, linked to it. Um, and the current framework that's in place where you are provided with funding, there is report backs. Sometimes that can be through to select committee. Um, so it depends how the arrangement is set up. So a lot more water under the bridge, um, but um, a good question for us to put to the side um, as this progresses to make sure that we, we um, consider that as we expect post-Cabinet consideration of the reform, sorry, review report that is provided by the panel there will be likely subsequent consultation on next steps. Can we have Councillor Spire's microphone on, please? No, don't, don't you worry about it. Can you? you sure? Okay. Councillor Halliday. Through you, Madam Chair. And um, it's a good point, Cathy, uh, and I, I appreciate, thank you very much for that, just a little bit of discussion, um, but I've just got a couple of key points I just wanted to maybe emphasise. Um, but I did note, in regards to what you're saying, that there is a talk here of um, protection of the, or having a constitution that protects local government as such, being a, a, one, of the points of our, uh, one, for one of the points of our submission. So that's good to see, because I, uh, whether we put more strength on that, but it's this progressing discussion with central government, how to protect local government, and therefore local democracy via a constitution for local government. Um, and I, I think that's quite important um, as we, you know, we can be just basically disbanded at any stage by central government. I think there needs to be protections there. Um, 
uh, for me, uh, number 20, uh, page 9. Um, we talk about our submission indicating strong support for climate change adaption and mitigation funding mechanisms by a central government that uses risk as a key criteria. And I'm wondering whether, how does urgency fit into that? Um, because risk is risk. But as we've seen up north, we, we, you know, and we've had to, we, have, um, we have declared a climate emergency, um, whether there needs to be more emphasis on the urgency um, of uh, this all being addressed rather than just looking at the risk aspect of it because risk doesn't really uh, indicate action. Um, it just it, it really just identifies identifying the problem, whereas we need to be doing that in tandem with how the heck are we going to address this and um, it not being the elephant in the room anymore. Um, it's now front and centre. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting nods around the table and cool. and staff have taken a note of that and I'll come back. Cool, and I don't, I don't need a response. Yes. And at number 21, uh, talks to number 21 on the same page. Um, we, we, we've, um, we're asking the government to consider additional alternative sources of funding. Um, maybe we need to even strengthen that a little bit with regards to saying that the current mechanism is not fit for purpose. Uh, it's very easy to just consider something from the sideline, it, but we need to make a clear image of that. Sorry, we don't consider the current system fit for purpose. Yeah, we'll make that change. Number 28, <coughs> and I've only got two more. Um, just talking about the Mayor um, publishing a series of opinion pieces about the review and the water and resource management reforms to raise awareness in the community about what central government is thinking. Yep, I think that's fantastic, but also I think it's important that we put down what local government is feeling in this space as well. Our community might be thinking that all we're doing is um, supporting what government's doing. We've got fear, I think, fear and reasonable concerns about a lot of this reform that's going on. And I think it's yeah. important that our community... Yep, certainly. Yeah, I'm happy to answer that, Councillor Halliday. So the, I've just approved the first of those. The content of those opinion pieces, I mean, I'm aligned with the councillor's thinking and the submissions that we've put in. Mm. So, um, so the... So my opinion aligns with the council's opinion, which yep. is reflected in the submissions that we're, we're putting forward. So I appreciate that. So no surprises in there, I hope. Cool. No, that's great. Uh, and the other one was on page 13 um, of the agenda, uh, chapter 4, answer 2. Um, it talks about um, the being driven by local well-being needs. Um, I appreciate that well-being is an important part of what we do, but our bread and butter, in my opinion, is infrastructure, um, as, again, has been shown by what's happened up north. Um, and um, so, I, while I appreciate that um, that we um, should be, uh, that well-being is important, I actually think uh, infrastructure needs to be uh, considered as a, as a as a more significant driver with regards to how we or what we need to be doing as local government. If it gets taken off us, it gets taken off us. But even if it is taken off us, it would still be an exceedingly high priority to ensure the quality of the infrastructure that's being put in place so that we can function. Uh, as a society, uh, the well-being colours all that in, if you like. But if we can't function as a society, well-being's go out the window very, very quickly. I've got an answer for that from staff. <coughs> Through you. Uh, I think when we're referring to the well beings we're leaning into the existing legislation, which requires local governments to consider the full well beings oh, And by rote... Um, infrastructure and some of the other activities and services we deliver connect up to the wellbeings. So I think we were, we were going for the broad um, sort of span of things we do um, with the acknowledgement that whatever we deliver into the future, it would be with the intent of focusing on those wellbeing areas. Um, uh, did you um, think there was a need to particularly... Um, lean into infrastructure as an example. Um, if so, we, we could do that in the piece that's specific to Capity. I, look, I guess what I'm emphasising, and, and look, I appreciate this as a precursor to consultation. I mean, um, you know, this is really just us, us sort of giving government our general views before we even really go heavily into the process. So there's going to be scope to tighten things up as we move through the process. I guess what I'm doing is just generally, and it's going to be, I dare say, a theme. Um, across the day maybe and certainly across the coming weeks um, with regards to that emphasis on infrastructure 
and, um, and, and local government delivery in that space and, and, and what we need to be doing. It's, it's all of a sudden become very significant and it's been very raised and it's only very recently, but it, it's potentially could be changing what our focus is um, as such as well. But I do appreciate what you're saying. It's just more bringing it to, into, should we say, staff awareness and as such. Thank you. Uh, well, I think it could be, be usefully included in our submission and highlighted as an example of how we deliver on those <coughs> those well-beings and certainly top of mind for people. And I'm getting some nods around the table for that, so we'll add that in. Councillor Wilson? Yep. <coughs> uh, thanks. I think this um, uh, generally encapsulates all of the points that were raised during our <coughs> workshop processes, etc. Um, I do think some of the claims that we're making in here are aspirational rather than actual, but that's cool, leaving that aside. Um, civics education, yep. Um, that's, uh, Martin, take close interest in that, I'm sure. Um, the uh, greater cooperation with our neighbours, I'd, I'd like to see that sort of fleshed out and what does that actually mean? Um, it says that we have close cooperation with our neighbours now, but. I'm not sure um, who we are in that category because I don't think that happens at a political level. So, so this council, for instance, we haven't met with any other council. Um, so yeah, I think there's a political role there that that could happen um, more frequently. It may well be that chairs get to talk with other chairs, you know, but there isn't currently a mechanism and I'd like to see one there um, because other count, you know, pretty sure that just about everything we do is brilliant, but there might be other councils that are doing stuff equally as well as us that we could learn from, so that's a bit of crap. Um, I would like to see some um, a bit more clarity around um, roles, um, particularly where addressing the ideas of amalgamations, which we'll, we all know, that's the elephant in the room, um, the local government reform is about amalgamations. Um, you don't have to drill down too far to find that. Um, <clears throat> and particularly in our area, so I'd like to kind of tease that out a wee bit more. Not not in the submission, but at some stage. And the other point I wanted to raise was, and I see it's been incorporated in here. I remember making the statement that a, um, a Maori ward and representation at the council table weren't mutually exclusive options, and I like that's nice that that wording's actually there. This is this would appear, and this is on the uh, bottom of page 23. Um, and to put my cards on the table, I'm I'm a fan of of the Maori ward. I think that's a great idea, um, and I don't think it's mutually exclusive from other forms of representation. I think you can have both. Um, Porirua City is already engaging in that way, and Wellington City is going the same. Um, but what this does, the way this is worded, this tends to um, put, uh, this is kind of directional from KCDC. It almost looks like a decision's being made. And asking government to um, that. Uh, we're looking for a legislative framework that entrenches that. Now that's kind of tricky, you know. So we're, it's, it, it's tricky if further down the track we want to have discussion, particularly with the, our iwi partners, and if they are still of a mind to say, no, 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 we just want it how it is, and we're asking for an entrenched piece of legislation that might be the opposite of that, then that might get tricky, you know what I mean? So um, just a little bit of food for thought, but um, other than that, yeah, I think it was an excellent report. Through you. Uh, I just want to pick up um, to respond to um, the, uh, I guess, a point around amalgamation. Uh, when the panel presented to uh, uh, local government officials last year, one of the things they said to us is they are not convinced that amalgamation is the way to go. Um, and I will share, um, happy to, I guess, publicly, um, that part of that was that they weren't convinced that what had been done in Auckland had been successful. And so they weren't convinced that pushing towards super cities was the way to go, and they actually wanted feedback 
um, uh, from the uh, from a really broad span of what do we actually think is meaningful and why. So it was back to the what are you actually trying to achieve because amalgamation in of its own sort of purpose may not be useful. So I just want to say that. Um, and I think the second point around um, the term of en entrenchment uh, take your your point. That is a very strong position to to sit on, and I think we could um, uh, yeah we could soften that word um, with, and still have the same intent um, because entrenchment from a legal perspective obviously has a specific meaning, and um, that takes it to a, a very significant level. Um, so happy to adjust that. That's great. Good point, uh, Councillor Coford. Oh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, just in, in light of the barrage of uh, government reforms that have been sort of forced on us, you know, intensification, three waters, and uh, health reforms recently, uh, is there a, a con consultation mechanism uh, in this uh, report to better uh, have a um, uh, relevance to the uh, Kapiti Coast. Uh, you know, intensification is just so out of uh, the character for Kapiti that it's uh, you know it's it's quite serious. So, is there a consultation process that we can have before we have these reforms forced on us? For you, uh, there is an existing process um, at Select Committee. Uh, and there is, uh, within that process, um, through what will be central government, the opportunity to push change through urgency. And in the current term of this government, some reform has been pushed through with urgency. So the usual mechanisms that may have been in place have either been shortened or in some places not occurred. Um, so there's that bit. Uh, it's a usual practice to have a good select committee process and we, through the processes that we're working through on this reform and some of the other uh, proposed legislative changes are um, uh, submitting into select committee, so that is occurring. Uh, in terms of intensification, at a local level, um, we are going through a due process um, uh, with notifying the community of change that we're proposing through the district plan as a result of central government direction that's been set. And that will be coming back to you to consider, um, that's council, uh, towards July this year. So um, the, the process um, includes obviously establishing a panel that is independently hearing submissions from the community. So there's an opportunity for people to put forward their views on the potential impact of the proposed change. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Chris, and through you, Madam Chair. So we have another bite of the cherry, do we, with regard to our 12-storey buildings and you know the Tier 1 requirements uh, for the Little Old Cavity Coast character? Through you, if, if I may say, I, I think we're going to come and talk to you about the different tools that exist um, for council and the community actually to shape and focus the way that we grow. So the um, change to district plan rules um, just sets um, really the guidelines or boundaries that we'd operate within how we grow and what we do. There's other tools that would be used including things you're, all, you're familiar with, like um, consents mm -hmm. and, and zoning, um, but also um, some of the visioning work we'll do with the community about how we want to look and grow. So it's one tool rather than the only thing that guides what we do. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, yeah. I have a response from the Chief Executive. Yeah. Thanks, Madam Chair. <clears throat> uh, just back to this report, I, um, I, I noted at the last um, local government New Zealand conference in Palmerston North that the, the Prime Minister, the then Prime Minister, made comment that the government would not do anything that wasn't asked by local government in relation to local government reforms, that is. 
also at the same time then Minister Mahuta uh, made comment that the local government reforms would not accelerate through this term. So there's some thinking back then uh, about what the process looked like. Um, she also said that amalgamation wasn't on the table, uh, which I thought was really interesting, because coming back to your point, um, Nigel, that is normally what you think about with reforms, is how do you change the scope or the landscape of what the current operating model is, so that was really interesting. Um, we're still seeing an accelerated pace in the need to respond to the reforms that are, that are, that are coming, and, and that is always of a challenge. Uh, and we haven't even touched on three waters, which we are all aware of. So, but but I, I take heart in those comments from the then prime minister and then minister that that this is still very much in an early stage of what a discussion might look like. Thank you. That's really useful context, Councillor Coe. Um, yes, look, another point which is maybe too detailed for your response, but I just want to pick up on attachment to theme one. Uh, about um, uh, campaign, election campaigns and making it more of a level playing field. Uh, and uh, as a, a first-time uh, campaigner, <laughs> who was actually abs yeah, absent, <laughs> don't tell anybody, for most of the campaign, <laughs> campaigning. Uh, but I think, you know, we, we're, we're way behind in terms of our use of technology for campaigning. And, and I think this is, it's quite important because, you know, how do we engage with people other than using billboards and the old, you know, meetings in the town hall kind of approach? Because it just doesn't work. We're not engaging with people, we're not involving them, we're not getting our messages out, we're not getting the feedback. And, um, and it, you, know, it, you know, we resorted to having to use dear old Sam Summers and it's in the ballot, you know, to provide some kind of a technology platform for people to use. And I, I think this is a, a really key issue, you know, who provides that platform? Because to me, it makes a lot of sense to have someone provide some kind of a, you know, technology platform where we can upload videos and, you know, have discussions, upload, you know, our um, election manifestos, if you like, um, pro to provide a central repository of information and point people to that. So that, they can go in and say, OK, I want to know about this candidate. Here's more than just what, you know, a couple of paragraphs in a booklet. Here's a whole, you know, manifesto from them. Here's some video information. Uh, and it's all centralised as opposed to, it's a bit random. Some of us had Facebook pages, some of us didn't. Some of us were on it, it's in the ballot, and some weren't. Uh, I just think we would really improve the whole level of uh, information exchange and make it a lot easier and less expensive for people if we were able to use technology uh, in that way, we may attract, um, uh, you know, different kinds of people. Uh, so I, I do think it's worthy of perhaps a little bit more of a mention. And you've got you because you've pointed it, you've listed it as a question. You know, it's just how can we make it easier for people to stand? I think it kind of, you know, comes in there as a partially an answer that, but somebody needs to provide that platform because we as individuals aren't going to do it for all the people we're competing against. So, so who's the right person to provide the platform? Thank you. And that's a really good point. And uh, staff have been taking notes, and we'll hear back with a, a draft around that. Uh, Councillor Halliday. Sorry, Madam Chair. I just want to endorse what uh, Councillor Coe was talking about. You know, local government or well, councils themselves take a very hands-off approach uh, with regards to um, support around this. It's, and I, I don't know whether that's legislated or whether that's just trying to keep... Um, that um, the scenario of influence away from the situation. But you're right, you know, we, we, there's some um, standard uniform platforms uh, that have been put in place for our community with regards to being able to access information. I don't see that as necessarily, as long as it's done in a way that everybody who, say, is campaigning has the same access rights to it um, as such, could be a good way to engage our community a lot more because. Yes, the information is all over the place, and what we're trying to do is get messages out. But um, what our community is trying to do is just trying to find out information about those candidates. And the easier that that is for them to do that, the more engaged they potentially can be. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how what level of detail our submission would um, would go into, but certainly will reflect that general theme in the in the in the text. Uh, Councillor Wilson. Yeah, just to um, address that. Um, 
I do know there's an excellent website called kcnews.co.nz, <laughs> which um, which had which had which had profiles of all of the candidates, and the the point of that really is that it was um, free, and one of the barriers to people standing um, for election is the cost. So the traditional cost of having to do flyers and billboards, etc., is out is outside the gift of a lot of um, people. So um, that was why that particular excellent website offered that to, for free <laughs> to everybody. Um, but it is but it is a good point because that yeah, maybe is we should the, go back to declarations of interest. Yeah. <laughs> But no, that, the, the point of that is, is that if you do, if you do have a technology-based um, approach, then it can be free, and it isn't a barrier to anybody um, entering any of these races. And it, yeah, it can be very, it can be very expensive. So looking at those sort of options, I personally think council itself should have as little to do with elections as possible, other than being the administrator of them. Um, you, it's just really, really easy for council to get thrown under the bus by a disaffected candidate, going, I didn't get blah, blah, blah. So really, the marketplace, I guess, is the place um, for that. So, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if our submission will particularly mention KC News. Excellent, <laughs> excellent though it is. But I, I certainly pick up on your last point of councils being as removed from the election process as possible and highlighting that in our submission if it's not sufficiently highlighted already. I'm not seeing any more lights on now, so I'm going to go to the recommendations. Oh, yeah, of course, Andre. Uh, kia ora koutou. D just a couple of um, responses. On page nine, um, there is a item 17, 18. It's reflective of the report writers helping to inform elected members those participants uh, in council engagement of the responses from mana whenua. And procedurally, I'm just wanting to, first of all, encourage elected members to help provide direction on what it is that you think would provide a more efficient and a more informative um, response to council when we're considering uh, matters within this context. Um, not always are we able to provide a response, but the, the brave step that's been taken to allow us to participate, I think, uh, provides a license for you to be very clear about your expectations regarding what this should read, how this should read. So that's the first thing. And I'm also wanting to take the liberty of questioning the correct title or reference to mana whenua. So at the present moment, mana whenua have been invited to provide representation across the various committees of council and, and within this forum, te whakamininga or kāpiti included. In the papers that we're looking at today, there are references to hapu, iwi, māori. I'd like to think that our submission and our response considers respectfully the colonial term māori that was conveniently introduced to identify us. My tūpunu who signed that piece of paper up there, didn't sign it as Māori. So respectfully, I think the terminology that we should be prepared to, should be prepared to use, should be reflective of the decision you've made to invite mana whenua, who are recognised because of that status, to engage with you directly in partnership. You've asked for our elected members to sit alongside the elected members of this district and to contribute uh, productively and constructively and respectfully um, to the business of this local authority. Um, and so I'm asking for us to please consider conformity because Māori doesn't cut it. I'm sorry, I'm not sitting here as a Māori representative. 
There's a whole process that we have to go through uh, before we are able to sit at this table as appointed representatives of mana whenua. And within that, we have the added responsibility to uphold our tiro rangatiratanga. So there's a word in this document that we've been reviewing that says rangatiratanga. Tiro rangatiratanga would be far more appropriate. And there's another word used in here around stewardship. I'd like to know what that means. How is that defined? Both in terms of the responsibility of elected members as stewards. I mean, on Saturday, you'll see me at the races in Ōtaki as a steward. I'll be exercising my stewardship. But in the context of what we're talking about today, I'd like to think that we're going to consider how we frame up appropriately the representation of mana whenua, of tangata whenua, uh, of hapu and iwi, of stewards. Um, perhaps kaitaki, mm. because tino rangatiratanga works alongside our inherited responsibility as kaitaki. So our kaitaki tanga iwi management plan, which I'm going to ask democratic services to issue to all elected members, actually provides that prescription. It would give you insight to how Tatiawa Ki Whakarungotai would respectfully ask for you, the democratic services, managers and the like, to engage with us. It's our prescription. We've done a lot of work to develop it. Finally, I'm pretty happy with the submission, uh, the responses that are reflective of the treaty partnership. Um, there's more information perhaps that I can generate that might refer more comprehensively around the partnership and we have provided a paper to Greater Wellington last year promoting a treaty house model. Perhaps that's something that this council could be exposed to so we can gain your knowledge and your advice on how you see that. Um, the last point I want to raise is in relation to um, item 29 page 10 uh, engagement planning Again, I've, I've circled the word Māori. Um, we've got mana whenua, Māori, iwi, hapu. I just wonder from elected members' perspective, what does that say to you? What does that actually mean? Who does that include? Yeah. So perhaps we can just talk more about clarifying that so that when we are um, engaging and we're reviewing reports and submissions as we are today, um, we become comfortable about how we uh, identify with one another. Uh, to me, this is really a bit confusing. It doesn't really respectfully identify not only mana whenua, but tangata whenua, iwi takitaki, you heard that word used recently because of the cyclone. Let's please consider the appropriate terms that define who it is that we're referring to. Uh, and the last point to do with item 29 is that um, we want to work alongside council just to determine uh, perhaps what any of the impacts or changes might mean in regards to our tino rangatiratanga and our kaitakitanga and looking forward to an update on where things are actually at in relation to this particular item on the on the agenda today. Uh, so I just want to add my comments to the helpful conversation today. Yeah, kia ora, Andre. We've certainly taken that on board, particularly around how we how we reference mana whenua and and those other today on tikanga Māori considerations within our reports and also our submissions. Um, it's potentially an ongoing piece of work that we could be doing with our mana whenua partners and also with um, our iwi partnerships team um, within council to make sure that we're we're doing better with that. Um, before I move to the recommendations, I have, um, Councillor Coe, did you put your light on after? I the, did. Do you have some I just to wanted add? to respond to Andre. I this. don't, yeah, so we're not in debate. So, no, 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 so no, going no to I just want to reinforce what, uh, some things that he has Yeah, said, okay, so. great, go ahead. Uh, okay. Yeah, Andre, thank you for that, because uh, as, as a first-time elected member, I have very, very little understanding of what the term uh, mana whenua means and what our obligations are under the Local Government Act. And, in fact, I was only talking to Janet, uh, was it yesterday or the day before, about how it would be really useful for elected members, I think, to have that kind of landscape of what is out there, you know, and what are all the different terminologies. How does 
you know, how do things work, if you like? Uh, because I, I have so little understanding, and I think it would be extremely helpful for all of us if we knew who was who and what was what and, and what these terms actually mean, because there's a, a huge significance to a lot of that terminology that I have no understanding of. Yeah. And uh, I think I would I would find it extremely helpful to have a, a greater depth of understanding of that. Thank you. Yeah, that's really good to hear, and I'm sure we all we all share that. So let, let's progress that um, as we move forward. Yeah. Apologies. Um, one one last comment. Um, the reference to the Māori ward on page 23. Um, I'm pleased that that was raised. I think it was you, Nigel, because actually that very second to last paragraph. I think should have read more reflectively by saying it wasn't just council that chose not to establish the Māori Ward. The three iwi, mana whenua, your mana whenua are very clear. Right now, at this moment, we want to consult further about that. So it wasn't just the council, it was actually, it was discussed with us. We discussed this internally, and it was a very clear message at the present moment from the three mana whenua on behalf of all iwi who live and reside in this district that the Māori Ward, for the moment, uh, wasn't on the agenda. But absolutely, the, it reflects the intention to continue discussing and consulting on that. And just thank you, Liz, for helping me to understand the need to, for us to develop clarity around the terminology that yeah. we use. Mm -hmm. And don't forget, 1994, we established one of the very first partnership models in New Zealand, in Aotearoa, the Whakamininga o Kapiti is the example. And we're going to review that, we're going to look at what we need to do to bring that up to spec. That's consistent with the, the review that Tatiya will lead. And so I'm looking forward to us coming together and agreeing on terms about how we define one another in a respectful manner. Yeah, it was certainly wonderful to have all our three partners at the table at our last Te Whakameninga or Kapiti meeting. So it's fantastic to have that up and running again. So I think this has been a really useful discussion, not in, just in terms of the submission, but in terms of lots of surrounding issues as well, and certainly an opportunity for a, a bit of a round the table discussion. So I'll move now to the recommendations. Um, just, just before I look for a mover of the recommendations, I'd just like to propose a change to C, seeing as the Deputy Mayor wasn't here for the discussion today, I'd propose to replace that position with Councillor Sophie Hanford as Chair of Strategy and Operations. And I'm looking, I'm looking for somebody to move the recommendations with that change, Councillor Wilson, seconded Councillor Coford. Is there any further debate? We've already kind of had debate and questions all in one. I'm not seeing any lights on, so I'll put that recommendation, moved by Councillor Wilson, seconded by Councillor Coford, A, B and C. Um, all in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against. That's carried. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Thanks, Chris. So now we have 10.2, a noting paper, Climate Emergency Action Update. What have we got for this one? I'm just looking for a presenter for this one. Mr. Mellon. Hello. That's all right. The um Yeah, sorry. Um, not sure if there's been some miscommunication in terms of presenting to the paper, but I'm happy to talk to um, the paper itself. It really is a um, previous paper that was presented to the 
I think it was the Climate and Environment Committee. Um, there was a number of questions and a lengthy discussion at that subcommittee. So the paper today is really um, for the purposes of noting uh, off the back of that previous um, conversation at the subcommittee meeting. And if, if I'm not able to answer questions, happy to possibly take some of those away um, if, if they are, uh, allow the paper to be noted and move forward. Yeah, th thanks for that clarification. There was certainly a lengthy and robust discussion, ably chaired by Councillor Pavanov, at the, um, the Climate and Environment Subcommittee meeting a couple of weeks ago. So um, today we're just uh, noting the paper and any further questions or comments are welcome, though the bulk of the discussion I think has already happened in that forum. Councillor Coford. Uh, yeah, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, Sean, uh, if you refer to page 41, item 10.2, appendix 2, uh, there's reference to a reservoir at Ōtaki. Is that public excluded or can we talk about it here? Is that actually uh, a, a, non <laughs> a project that's been given approval, or uh, I just wondered where it, uh, the status of it was. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Yeah, yes, there is. So there's a reservoir proposed in the long-term plan. So um, there's a project that's referenced in there. There's been a communication uh, with regard to the infrastructure acceleration funding that's been provided to the council to for the purposes of. Providing infrastructure in Otaki, and that includes the reservoir. So um, there, is, there is no issue with regard to discussing a proposed new reservoir. Uh, the paper itself is not not really specifically with looking at discussing particular projects, right. as opposed to the overarching position, I guess, in terms of council's current um, climate update. Okay. So Thank it's you. just a general uh, requirement uh, that Oteki requires a, uh, for climate change, <coughs> excuse me, uh, requires a water supply facility. <coughs> I, I guess I'm happy to answer questions on that. I mean, I could spend yeah. a lot of time explaining yeah. the resilience elements associated with the reservoir yeah. are significant, and certainly a reservoir has been, um, has been needed and has been a significant project that we've been looking at developing for Otaki for at least um, the time that I've been here at Council. Yeah, I think what this paper does is it brings it into the context of those extra resilient, that extra resilience that's required as a result of climate change. But um, yeah, so, so happy to bring a further update on that. Yeah. Oh, we're, to, we're having a, further a discussion. briefing about it, aren't we, anyway? Yeah. So it's not cast yeah, in concrete, that's right. it's not cast so in concrete at the moment? Are you? <laughs> or metal? <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, Councillor Halliday. <coughs> Mine isn't really a question. I mean, it's, it's, um, we had quite robust questioning uh, when this came through a workshop, and um, there's been a lot of work and there's a lot of things happening in this space, which I think is fantastic. Um, one of the um, sobering things that came out of that, from my perspective, um, is I appreciate Council's working and doing its bit. You know, we've, we've had substantial reductions that Council has done. Uh, our problem is the rest of the district. Um, you know, I think the emissions have increased by a third. Um, in the last 10 years um, as a district. So, I, I, as I mentioned before, um, I, I have a general theme here, and um, that for me is um, when are we going to get serious about this stuff? Um, and I, I mean that with all due respect, but with what's happened up north, you know, people were talking about climate and climate issue turning up tens of years from now. It's not, it's turning up yesterday. And um, I'm very, very concerned, and I think a lot of people are, that this has now been brought into a, a different focus. You know, and our systems that we have in place, it's, we, we can't continue as business as usual. I don't know how we approach that, but I think we need to have some very serious discussions in very short order, uh, potentially in how we do. Uh, I don't know, I, I don't know. Uh, our planning, where we build, um, the ease to mitigate, via legislation, which is not in place, public buy-in. Mm. And 
I guess part of the issue is, I mean, we, we had a we had a, a, a meeting this morning, or a breakfast meeting this morning with our youth council, and on a smaller scale, you know, they were talking about uh, how how do we how do we make things happen, you know, and, and again that that issue is don't try and solve the problem that's out here today in its entirety, but you've got to you know put the foundations in place and have to be moving forward. I think there needs to be systemic change on how we do things and think. The question is, how do we instigate that? When do we instigate it? And when do we have those conversations? We don't have to go out to our community and get a mandate from them. Okay, the mandate's coming from the skies. But I mean, it's coming from the hills. And, um, and it's serious. Uh, and it has, it has implications on how we operate as a society moving forward. It's big, bicky stuff. So my... It's not even a challenge. I guess my question or something I just want to put out there is how do we create the space in the short term to have open and frank conversation about what the hell we do moving forward? I just want to leave it at that. Okay. Um, I appreciate that. That was, that was a really um, thoughtful contribution. Um, um, for the last paper, because it was a draft submission and there was a kind of crossover between questions and debate, I allowed for there to be quite a free-flowing discussion during questions. Um, I'd like to move back now to kind of adhering to standing orders a bit more. So if anybody has any questions, particularly relating to this paper, please leave your microphones on and otherwise please wait until we've had a mover and seconder and moved into debate so that we can time speeches and things like that. Councillor Bravanov. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I just wanted to um, to highlight some wording on page um, 43. And um, I raised this actually at, at, during the subcommittee, and unfortunately at the time, Mr Mellon had leave, left the room. So the wording here, it's in the, um, it relates to clearance of the um, Narara stream. And the wording says emergency works at the Narara stream to mitigate um, risks associated with with council-owned water, wastewater infrastructure was completed. Um, so the wording is correct, um, but it was actually instigated by um, a group of 70 households because that dra drain hadn't been maintained and um, the emergency works could only be done um, to facilitate. Have you got a, a question around this? The question is, um, I actually asked for the wording to be updated, and that hasn't happened, so I'm just wondering <coughs> if that can be updated, please. Can I have an answer, please? Thank you. Uh, certainly, I was aware that had been raised, but the, the, the wording as it stands at the moment is, uh, I guess, in my view, correct. The staff's view is correct as to one of the primary drivers for the work that was actually undertaken. So I won't accept debate with um, staff on that. Do you any, have any further questions? I would like to I'll have a conversation um, outside this meeting on that because I think... Yes, it, it, it appears your concerns haven't been addressed. Yes, correct. So, so it, we'll, we'll take that offline, I think, That's unless okay. you want to... Uh, oh, I just I would add there may have been other peripheral issues, but the primary... Uh, reasoning for undertaking the work, which is basically what this this, this report covers, was the 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 need to mitigate the risks to the council uh, sewer that runs through that area. I think the point is, and I, as I said, I won't accept debate with staff members. If you have any further questions, please ask yeah. them. Otherwise, we'll take it offline. So, don't you agree that um, the um, concerns of seventy? Um, no, that, 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 that's my question that's is. Rhetorical question. My question is, um, do you not do you not believe that the issues raised by those seventy um, householders um, was actually the reason that drain was cleaned out? As I've stated through the mayor, the primary reason for doing that work was to mitigate the risk to the sewer through that area. I think we've had we've had an answer from staff's perspective, but clearly there is some outstanding concerns which we'll take offline. Okay. So I'll look for a mover and a seconder for the recommendations on page twenty nine. 
of the papers. So we've got uh, A1, 2 and 3, which are basically noting various reports around climate issues. Um, Councillor Wilson, are you wanting to move those? No, no, I want to discuss it. We're going to discuss it after we move and second them. I don't want to move this, no. Okay, uh, do I have a mover? Somebody else can. Moved by Councillor Coe, seconded by Councillor Halliday. So uh, we'll move now into debate, and I have Councillor Wilson. Yes, okay. The reason I didn't want to move it is because I think it's hopelessly inadequate, to be honest. We have a um, we have accelerated growth plans. <clears throat> Emissions across the district are up. Um, I, um, in reference to um, what Councillor Halliday was talking about, um, he's a hundred percent correct. I don't think this does anything to dispel the disquiet of those who believe that our response is underwhelming. Given that a climate emergency was declared in 2019, our response has been, in the eyes of a great number of people, very, very poor. And I don't think this goes anywhere near addressing the significance of it. So, um, you know, people are really unhappy about it out there. And we might be using recycled toilet paper, I don't know, but the greater emissions target is something that the public want to know, what are we doing? And I'm not sure that I've seen anything that, se that seriously addresses that. You know, imagine if, if we decided that public transport and cycling were going to be, um, have primacy in our district. And if that, was your, if that was your base platform to start about how we might deal with emissions, but I'm just not seeing it. And in 2019, you know, it was a long time ago, so, Councillor Wilson, that's why we have a workshop coming up and we're going to be refreshing this piece of work. Yeah. Um, what we're doing today is noting where we are yeah. at the moment, and certainly yeah. that's some useful input into how seriously we want to take this and yeah. how we might move forward. Well, so, just, my final, just my final point on that, then, is that, and that's great, the fact that we are going to have workshops, that we're going to do, do these things, uh, just bear in mind that, that the Council has been having those workshops for four years. So... It's the intent that you go into them. If the intent when you go into a workshop is to determine an outcome and what that outcome might be, that will drive the intensity of it. If it's just marking time, which is what's happened largely for the last four years, then, you know, and it's only when you get a cyclone, suddenly everybody goes, wow, this stuff's urgent. It's been urgent for a long time. So I, if we're going into that workshop process, I would like to see us going into that really serious about in outcomes and quickly. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Uh, Councillor Hanford. Yeah, Councillor Wilson, I couldn't agree more. I think that um, if we go into both those workshops but also the visioning process as a table, really, really clear on the fact that the climate crisis needs to be up there as number one and that everything else has to kind of, we have to be able to demonstrate the interconnectedness to that activity, the kaitiaki, um, the kaitiaki tanga of, you know, the, the whenua and the land around us and the, the natural world needs to be front and centre of every single thing that we are doing and not compromising that in any way, shape or form and being, being bold about what we're prioritising and how we're prioritising it and also the... Um, yeah, the, the timeliness of the action. I would love to see a united table around that and ensuring also that um, the reports that are brought back for noting in the future that we can all feel really, as you're saying, really proud of, of the things that we're undertaking. But I do also really want to acknowledge all of the hard work that happens behind the scenes to, to even get the work that, um, that we're seeing kind of off the ground and into action. And talking about too, um, just to, if you'll allow me, um, Madam Mayor, Something else to just note while we're on um, on the topic of this this paper around our our kind of climate response is the fact that there's a school strike for climate next Friday, the third of March, two p.m. at Civic Square, marching down Lambton Quay, meeting at Parliament by three to put some pressure on central government as well to do their bit, um, and also creating kind of more mechanisms for us to and, and more funding for us to take the actions required at a local level. Um, but also to, to get really serious at a central government level about transformational shifts that we know need to be made to allow individual action, to support and enable individual action, 
um, but also to show leadership. And I think we have a real, real responsibility to show that leadership to our community. And I think they're looking to us to us to provide that, and so they should be. So, yeah, really, really keen to carry the same energy that's been spoken about now into those workshops and make sure that that's, yeah, front and centre, which I think I think we're, we're doing and we'll just, we'll just have to keep doing to make sure that that happens. <coughs> Councillor Halliday. Through you, Madam Chair. I just want to endorse all the comments that have been made so far because this is a broad conversation. Um, I do want to uh, acknowledge um, council officers though because you're between a rock and a hard place here. Um, you know, I, I do want to acknowledge there's been a lot of hard work done on very limited resources um, in this area. And, um, you know, we, we, we've, we've done pretty good on our targets. Our problem is, is that community is not doing the same thing. Um, and our community can point their finger at us and go, well, what's council doing? Actually, well, council's doing a heck of a lot. Uh, the problem is, is everyone's busy in life. And, um, and they don't, you know, until it turns up on your doorstep, that's not a problem, it's tomorrow's problem. Well, it's tomorrow's here. Uh, not as bad as it could be, but that could just be around the corner. And, um, and even, even um, yourself, Councillor Hanford, with regards to looking at how we, how we um, have our relationship with our environment, there may be, need to be some hard engineering decisions here as well with regards to how we move forward. Because yes, we have to work in synergy, but we also have to um, thrive, well, thrive, but, um, but, but be able to uh, participate in our environment as well. So there's got to be that balance there um, with regards to it's very hard decisions to make, some very interesting um, decisions around how we finance all this um, as well, and it could be a major shift in our priorities. Uh, not because um, we think it's the right thing to do, uh, but because we have to do it. And I think that's the key thing here. It's not a, this is not a, uh, we don't have a luxury of choice here. That this is something that has to be addressed. Uh, that, and, I'll, and I'll leave it at that. But, uh, thank you, officers. I think uh, the work we've done to date has been great. It would be nice to have um, had our community buy in harder in this scenario, but hopefully um, the advertising campaign, unfortunately, that's unfolded up the coast, um, wakes our community up to the fact that we have to address and we have to be working forward. Everyone has to buy into this. Councillor Pravanov. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, so first of all, I you know would like to acknowledge the, um, the, the the staff members who are involved in this, and I know that they're very very passionate about the work that they do. But I also understand or know that there's only a very limited number of people working in this area, and their resources are limited. And um, I suppose I'm just going to extend a little bit more on, upon what has just been previously said by my fellow councillors. And I actually said this at the subcommittee meeting, and this is before this latest event, is that um, it shows, that this paper shows that there is an absolute um, massive list of activities that, um, that have been undertaken. Um, but I suppose this is all being initiated by um, our, our um, climate emergency, and that in itself is not really um, being mentioned much in this paper, and I think we need to really think about where that climate, you know, where our action is going on that, you know, our targets, whether or not we're going to meet them, whether or not we're not. So I think that's something that we really need to think about in this workshop coming up. The other thing is too, is that, um, so we see the actions and we see that the fact they completed in the comments, but. Um, with limited time and resources, to me, it's really important to spend the money where you can make the biggest differences. And with this information here, unfortunately, we can't actually see how much of a difference they are making in reducing our emissions. And that's probably quite a tough thing to do. So you've got both the council initiatives as well as the district-wide ones. And I, I think, you know, we need to really hone in on actually spending our money and our time that can actually make the biggest um, impacts in these in these areas. And then of course, obviously since then there's been these much, you know, we've become even more focused on dealing with stormwater, um, you know, making sure that we're as resilient and as, um, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr Butler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I assume this is probably a question for Sean. How many staff do we actually have who are directly engaged on climate change or emissions reductions? Like, a, you know, that is actually their job. 
sorry, Madam Chair Council, I, I couldn't give you a number because that is embedded in in various areas of the organisation into staff job descriptions and, and work that they undertake. So the stormwater team, for instance, you could suggest that those people are also directly involved in um, adaptation associated with that. So we have a, a, a team of nine staff in the sustainability. Three doing climate change. Yeah, um, but yeah, I couldn't tell you the exact number. Uh, happy to, to have a conversation uh, offline as to what that yeah, that number might, might be, but yeah, again, you've got variations in terms of who's directly involved and who's delivering and implementing that work as well. Okay, so where I was leading to with that was the fact of, given the strong statements that have been put out by some of the councillors here, are we putting enough staff towards this, or is it something we need to look at in terms of staffing to put more emphasis on it, given some of the direction that's coming from the councillors? I think that's something that we, we would address through annual and long-term planning process, but certainly a very good question to put out there. I think I heard from Brandy that there are three staff members particularly focused on climate change at the moment, so I, I'm not sure at first look whether it's a staffing issue or whether it's how we focus our efforts, and I think we've heard some really useful discussion around the table about that today. Um, <coughs> certainly we've, we're doing a lot in this space. I don't, I don't want anybody to get the impression that we're not from our conversation today, but we've had a bit of direction from elected members on how we would like to potentially focus those efforts further. Um, Councillor Cooper. Thank you. I was going to sit here quietly, and then I just thought I won't. I, because um, I take probably a bit, of, a bit of a different tack than the other people in the room. I, I think our focus should be these mitigation adaptation and I think we should be 90% in the adaptation and 10% in the mitigation. The reality is we could take every single car off the road and not have a single car, a single bus, a single truck in Kapiti, and it would have no effect whatsoever on world climate. So for us and our residents, um, yes, education is important. We want to be good citizens in the world, and we should be working, you know, to be better humans. But... We've seen around the country in the last 12 months that we actually need to be laser focused in that 90% of the adaptation, in my view. And, you know, we, we have a whole fleet, go to a whole fleet of EV vehicles at great expense, yet we've got people who've got flooding around their houses when we get a sprinkle of rain. So I just think we need to, and that I guess we'll work through our workshops, but that would just be my, my personal view. Thank you for that thought. So I'm not seeing any further lights, so um, I'll go to Andre Baker. Kia ora, Madam Chair. Uh, item 11 from page 30. Just confirming uh, that there, there was significant consultation with Te Te Ki and we want to express our expectation of having ongoing involvement. But that's sort of just providing a response to again, if we go and look at Tangata Whenua, uh, item 45, page 33. Would it be helpful in, in consideration of the question about human resource, for example, for item 45 to record that we have two of our mana whenua representatives from Tatiawa that are on the Coastal Advisory Group. They'll be meeting on the 1st of March. One of our uh, professional consultants, Taio Tangi Marie, is the, actually the technical lead on the tech advisory group. I mean, I'm just wanting to signal to you that if this type of information is informative, is helpful, this is perhaps how we could help frame up Tangata Whenua if you're going to identify us in the reports. And of course, our, um, our worldview is taking a comprehensive approach climate change. Everything above, everything on the ground and below. Um, and so we would absolutely want to engage with Council to help understand the traditional worldview regarding our approach to looking after Thayo. And it wasn't a surprise. Um, in advance of Western science professionals telling us there was going to be a cyclone, um, the Maramataka was telling us um, that there was reasons to believe that 
Papa Tuanukru wasn't happy. So is that an opportunity to further our understanding and appreciation for the worldview of Aotearoa? We may not be able to have a, a necessary, necessarily have a big impact on the global stuff, but in our world, there's some traditional knowledge, there's some traditional views that are upheld again within our Kaitakitanga iwi management plan that are well based on, on our uh, inherited history and knowledge and experience from being here uh, for a long, long time. And I'd be excited for you to know who it is actually that is responsible for informing us from Tatiao Kipakurunga Pai. Not here to speak for Ngāti Tō Nga Hapu, but again, perhaps um, this could be a conversation with our, our group manager and our democratic services so that information could be visible in these papers so that you actually know, oh, so Tarangi Māori is the lead technical expert on this group. If you think that it's helpful to you, then I'd like to have your uh, direction, if you like, for us to pursue that further so that the information that is complementary to the work that our officers are doing is visible to you and visible to us. Thank you. I think that would be um, really useful to bring that out into the open, that, that the huge amount of work that goes on behind closed doors and also taking that to our Māori perspective in, the, in these issues. So I'm just checking in with Councillor Coe. You didn't want to write a reply because you were the mover of the motion. No, waved. Um, so I'll put those motions. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against. That's carried. We'll now take a 10-minute break until quarter past. <laughs>